Good morning, everyone. You're all very welcome to the second webinar in our series on building blocks for scale. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing the importance of planning to achieve scale. So my name is Tom Early, and I lead the funding and scaling solutions team within Enterprise Ireland, the goal of which is to work with our clients to help them access appropriate funding to scale their business in a rapid and sustainable way. Last month, uh, we discussed with Professor Jonathan Levy the building blocks that are needed to be in place to successfully scale your business. And then we heard from Nick Keegan, the CEO and founder of Mail Metrics, and he shared their phenomenal growth story. Uh, today, uh, the, uh, we're going to focus on the need for a scale up plan. So, first, we're going to hear from Paul O'Dee, who's going to speak to us about how to scale a company and the importance of planning to do that. And it's all too often that companies get caught up in the day-to-day -day and actually fail to achieve their, their true scaling potential. Then we're going to speak to Mark Barrett, who's the co-founder and CEO of APC and VLE uh, Therapeutics. And we're going to speak to, about how he has grown his company to nearly 300 staff and had high double-digit annualized growth. And he's done all of this without VC or PE funding. So look, Let's get started. I'm going to invite Paul O'Dee to come onto the, the screen. And for those of you that haven't had the pleasure of working with Paul like I have, uh, he's the MD of Select Strategies and he works with companies on developing their plans like APC. Uh, he has uh, co-founded and scaled several technology businesses. He sits on boards of companies and he invests. He's written three books on the topic of scaling and more importantly, he's actually published them. Uh, and he has spoken to uh, at Stanford University and Cambridge. So, Paul, have I left anything out from that introduction? Tom, that's a, a super introduction and delighted to be here. It's a really uh, exciting topic that's very close to my heart. I um, mean, select strategies we've been over the past 20 years working with companies trying to scale their businesses and probably believe there's never been a better time for Irish companies to be thinking about scale and defining their scale up journey. A lot of what I'll share over this morning is based on what we call a growth roadmap for scaling. And it just helps, or it's a book which you kindly introduced, which helps companies on the path to scale and get their teams aligned around it. But what I'd particularly like to share is just some examples or some practical examples of scaling agendas or what companies have done on their path to scale. So when we think of scaling, it's useful for us to maybe start at the point of why is scaling hard and why does it create value? So there's a lot of evidence internationally and also in Ireland that companies that actually successfully scale up create about two thirds of the value when they scale up. And that scaling up often involves penetrating a significant proportion of their target market. But surprisingly, only 1% of companies achieve this scale up. And most of the investor money and most of the entrepreneurial growth is achieved when these companies go through this stage from startup to early growth to scale up. Now, in Ireland, we have never had a better chance to scale up when you think of where the scale up center for many of the US multinationals, whether that's in pharma or whether it's in technology. We have excellent capability there. And we also have a cadre of entrepreneurs, ambitious entrepreneurs who've already scaled up, who are also on the path to scaling up. And I think you're, we're going to hear a very good story from Mark Barrett from APC later, which is going to get into the practical side of that. But overall, scaling a business is hard, but generates real value. So I guess the question we're left with is, why do companies or how do companies scale up? So firstly, I think the first takeaway that we generally take when we as select strategies are engaged with clients on scaling up is that often the scale up journey starts better with a look at the external environment. Many entrepreneurs are focused a little bit much and inevitably on the inside of their businesses because there's so many challenges to building a business that they're very inwardly focused. Whereas we see the opportunity to scale up as being often driven from the external environment. And right now, whether it's digitization, whether it's geopolitical, whether it's regulation, 
whether it's uncertainty in the environment, these environments present great opportunities to scale. But ultimately, you need a map, and hope is not a strategy when it comes to uh, when it comes to scaling. So when we think of scaling, we probably are often drawn towards the metaphor of a mountain, and often scaling is driven by the strength of the entrepreneurial team. Sometimes it's the founders and how that senior team has evolved over, but it's an unrelenting persistence for something that is, if you like, rapid growth. They're, they're almost, and you'll hear this again from Mark and you'll hear it from others, there's almost a dissatisfaction with the status quo. So scaling teams will often ask the question, they won't just be satisfied with, well, we're growing at 10% a year or 15% a year. That was a bit better than last year. They'll be demanding of themselves, well, what's the market growth? What's our competitor growth? How do we grow more quickly or scale more quickly and within that deliver a viable business model? So it's not just growth for growth's sake. It's growth that has a business model underneath it that actually delivers revenue and, and EBITDA. So maybe the first place to start for companies that are uh, participating today or indeed advisors is to try and understand what we call the scale up gap. So you can see on the axes, a timeline across the bottom and up on the vertical axis, there's a scale up percentage. So the bottom line shows current business performance where we are now. And that may be very good. It may be very satisfactory and the team may be very happy with that and don't particularly want to change or don't have the ambition to change. Whereas with scale up companies, we see that dissatisfaction or persistent desire to go in a different trajectory and they define the scale up gap. Now, whether that scale up gap is driven by something like capability that they need to build sales capability or they need to strengthen the team or whether it's a scale up gap that the market is growing a lot more quickly. Because if the market is changing a lot more quickly than you're changing inside, that may be a telltale sign that you need to be doing something about it quickly. So the first part is a diagnosis and that diagnosis should be clear and transparent to everybody on the team. It shouldn't be trying to put lipstick on the pig or do anything like that. It should be very clear diagnosis. What are our key issues? What are our key opportunities? What are the key issues that we need to address to address the scale up gap? So I'm going to just tell you a brief story and I'm going to tell you a brief story taking uh, the story of a company in Dundalk called Annard Mardix, which may or may not be familiar to you. When we look at any company, we often look at it through the lens of the business model. Because frequently the entrepreneur is drawn to a particular part of the business model. So if it's a very technical entrepreneur, they may be drawn a little bit technically. Whereas if it's a very sales-led entrepreneur, they may be drawn from a sales perspective. So we just use this simple canvas and many other tools that some of you will be familiar with. So the canvas demonstrates or shows the internal business model. So you can see on the right-hand side, we start off with customer segments. Then as we go from right to left, we see customer relationships, distribution or sales channels, value proposition, et cetera. And what I'm just going to do is to share the story of persistence of scale of Anard Mardix, which was a company that's when we first met them in 2012, they were focusing on providing critical power services. So essentially a manufacturing and implementation company of critical power services to 12 different customer types. And that 12 different customer types led them to a business that was relatively successful, but struggling to scale. It was doing about 15 million in revenue. The first part of the planning exercise was to look at segmentation and value proposition. So that first part and plan one, as you see being called up there, focused on prioritizing the most valuable customer segment. Now, in 2012, it wasn't very clear, but certainly became clear over time that they should focus on a very large growing segment, which was data centers. So they focused on data centers and also adjusted the value proposition. But that was the first scaling wave, if you like. The second scaling wave was to deepen their customer relationship with enterprise level 
customers in the data center sector. So those customers would have included ones that you would expect, whether it was an Amazon, whether it was Google, et cetera. And also that they to build a repeatable, scalable sales machine and strengthen the leadership team. So you see this phase two, if you like, of the scaling agenda was very customer oriented. And I know that customers are very passionate, very close to Mark's heart and that he will cover those in his Q&A session with Tom. And then finally, the third stage was to build deeper manufacturing capability in the US closer to their clients, to secure major funding, and also to really focus on the top and bottom line of the, the business model. Now, Anard's story, which was back in 2012, hovering around the mid-teens in revenue, that business now is exceeding 300 million in revenue. And it has taken, done some m &A, uh, along the way as well. So the key point here is that scaling happens in waves. It's not a one and done. It's something in waves and it's a deep capability that companies build themselves. So finally, what we encourage is a framework, whether you use a framework like this or another framework, is that scaling is an overall framework that looks at the business model, whether it's the diagnosis that we talked about with Anard, whether it's vision and demand and the entrepreneurial leadership that wants to take the company to some new place. The strategy, whether that strategy is about what customers to select or what products or markets, scaling which builds capability. So it's to have an overall scaling framework that scaling is almost a, uh, an inherent part of capability in the company that transcends all different functions. So finally, some tips. So in our experience, and Emer O'Donnell will be very strong on this, who co-wrote the book, The Growth Roadmap, team alignment is essential. So planning effort, efforts should be collaborative. This is a team sport, not an individual one. The output should be clear and coherent in narrative format. So it should be readable rather than beautiful PowerPoint slides. The plan should create a common language and approach across the team. It should be very specific on outcomes and timelines and how you will measure progress. And finally, good planning is focused on execution, that disciplined follow through is final. So I look forward to the rest of the session and I'm going to pass back over to Tom. Well, to, uh, Paul, just before you go, you, you said something there that, that I suppose really resonated with me. And maybe I might just ask you to expand on that a little bit. And, and apologies to the webinar uh, people where I'm breaking the format. Um, but but when you were talking about, uh, and I, th I think, yeah, like it, it's a saying I always have to the man with a hammer, the whole world is a nail. But you, you, you were saying that, you know, if your technology becomes very technology focused, if it's sales, it becomes sales focused. Is the whole purpose of the business plan really to... To, to bring about a balanced view uh, of how a company should be grown. So you're considering all different aspects because there's no point in developing super tech if you're not you know, looking at how you're going to reach the end consumer and sell into them, or that if you don't look and make sure that you have the funding or, or the people in place to be able to, to do it. I mean, yeah, I think that's exactly it. And um, the man with the hammer is 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 dangerous because he'll he'll always find or she'll always find nails to hit. Whereas scalability is a cross business capability, and whether that is looking at the market, and often the answers are in the market, but it's an overall view, and the leadership team should be able to look at the business model in that way. Because as you saw in that Anard case, you have different waves of scalability but it should be cohesive across the business, not just a one particular track. One particular track will only get you so far. You'll get stopped on the pyramid. You're building your way up the pyramid all the time. Uh, and so that feeds into your other top tip then, which is about having the right team in to, to, to do it because you, you're looking for people different from you with different skill sets so that they bring their own hammers. So Exactly. And you can see, certainly in the clients we've been with for over 10 years in this scaling journey, you can see inflection points occur when different capability is brought internally. So, for instance, you might have a very entrepreneurial CEO, and then there's an inflection point when a strong COO comes to manage the operational parts of the business to allow the CEO to start thinking about or working on the next wave. 
Okay. All right. Well, look, Paul, thank you. That was uh, fantastic and really, really interesting. Um, for anybody who has questions for Paul, can I encourage you to put them into the Q&A? Um, Paul will join us again at the last segment of uh, today's webinar uh, so he can answer those questions then. So now I would actually like to invite uh, Mark to join us on camera. So Mark is uh, Mark Barrett is the co-founder and CEO of ATC and VLE Therapeutics. So he founded APC in 2011 and then VLE Therapeutics in 2021. So right from inception through to commercialization, I think you have what 300 people now. It's the largest employer of scientists in pharma R&D and you have plans to continue on this growth strategy. I understand that you were Ernest & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year, one of the finalists in 2017. You've done our Leadership for Growth program in 2019. Uh, and uh, you, you, you're uh, got, got a professional chemical engineering, um, UCD chemicals. So, wow, uh, a long list of, of qualifications, um, uh, Mark. So, like, yeah, yeah. Well, again, I'm going to encourage everybody. If you've got Q and A, uh, if you've got a question, please put it into the chat, and and I'll I'll try and get to them as well. But we might just start out, uh, Mark, and I'm going to start out with an easy question before I get progressively more nosy. And dive into your business, but you might um you might just sort of explain what APC does and VLE Therapeutics. Just give us a bit of background on them. Yeah, sure. We 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 would call the group of companies the uh, the medicine accelerator. We essentially bring together really compelling technology, IP, and a phenomenal team to essentially accelerate how medicines are developed and launched. So you can see here behind me, we have lots of laboratories, lots of scientists hard at work trying to figure out some of the hardest scientific challenges in the world uh, across different vaccines, uh, therapeutics and Alzheimer's, oncology and more. So we, we would partner with pharma companies throughout the world to help them accelerate how their medicines are developed, essentially. So uh, uh, the company was founded in 2011 by myself and uh, uh, my professor, Professor Brian Glennon. Uh, we had some real compelling research that was getting uh, some international profile. And we, we essentially uh, took that to, uh, to to industry with some ideas and, and got the business off the ground, essentially. Uh, and you, But you've gone on quite a growth journey. I mean, you might just talk us through that. Like, how did, how did that come about? I mean, yeah, yeah, sure. There, there's probably a few important parts to the journey that I, 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 and I think in today's climate is really important. Uh, we were formed out of the, the backdrop of the last financial crisis in 2011, really, uh, the backdrop economically for funding a kind of high working capital, large asset base based business like APC, it was pretty nil at the time. Um, so, you know, we formed a company with two euros like the, the, and kind of bootstrapped it. Uh, and how we did that, I think it's really important to today's backdrop is, um, you know, if we stand back from any business, it's essentially the exchange of services or goods or products for the delivery of value to a customer and a customer will pay for that. Now, I think very often people in that process get lured into the venture capital private equity dynamic to fund that journey. But I think what's really interesting is the customer is interested. You, you give the upside to the venture capital and the private equity uh, uh, companies. You sell them a plan, a plan based on hope, and, and they will exchange money for that hope. Your customer will do the same thing. So we, we very much focused on uh, sitting down with our early stage customers, to, giving them a sense of our plan, where we wanted to take it, the value we would create for them. And essentially based on that, we could come up with some uh, contractual terms where they would fund the early working capital for the business. So to this day, I still apply the same rule. You know, I would passionately sit down with the customers, really explicitly try to understand their needs, uh, paint a picture of how our technology and team can help them and bring them into the dynamic where they'll exchange money to me with the view that I can build this out for them. And I think that that's a journey that many entrepreneurs and founders miss. I think they go straight for the VC private equity dynamic. Uh, I think if they put as much passion into kind of talking to their customers, uh, they could they could drive the business in a different way. So that's kind of the, the, the early, maybe that's an important part of the how we started the business. And um, from there, we, we, we've scaled uh, independent of private equity and venture capital. We've built out a a 60,000 foot headquarters here is about 70 million euros worth of assets within it. Uh, and we have a scaling agenda, like Paul mentioned, real ambitious plan to kind of deploy another 60 to 70 million euros worth of capital to scale the business and to exit over the next number of years. Um, but the only way 
that we've done that, Tom. Um, if I could just t- take a moment to kind of give people her- like the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, behind me here, this is a uh, this is our growth plan from 2016. Um, I wrote it myself. Um, I didn't tell anyone about the growth plan because it's it was very much my plan. Uh, deep in the business, battling the deals, the team, trying to get things to work. Uh, but back then it was a, a stationary plan, not operationalized, not led really. It's just a set of ideas. Um, now kind of where we're at, um, you know, this is our kind of scaling plan here. It's a, you know, I think it's got about 50 pages of it or so. It's a constant living, breathing plan that is iterated on a quarterly basis. Um, and I probably am putting more effort into our constant iteration of our scaling plan than actually running the business. Uh, every euro we get, Tom, as a business, we start to scale. And as you start to scale, your value proposition changes to your team and to your customers. You have to constantly consider and reevaluate your plan as you go. So that's kind of a, an indication. Without this plan, I wouldn't have a leadership team, wouldn't have the customers, wouldn't have the market penetration. It would just be me and the whiteboard, essentially. All right, you've said a lot of things that I want to ask you questions of over there. So, so, uh, all right, I'll start off with the the obvious one because I'm I'm sure there's a lot of people who perked up their ears when they said you did all this with a VC and private equity funding. I mean, was that intentional or was that just a feature of the market at the time that that it was just too hard to actually try and raise funding? So you had to, you know, what is it? They say a mother is the necessity of a or necessity is the mother of invention, and it was kind of like. I just needed to get out there or did you actually sit down and say no i want to avoid this route and here's how i'm mapping out how i'm going to get there yeah i, I think the backdrop tom was pretty negative at the time and um, right. we go back to, the, to that period so really probably the decision brian and i when we were starting we said look you know in a business you have to create value and if the value is good enough for the customer they'll pay for it mm-hmm. so we kind of probably and to this day, and, and I work with Paul constantly on this, we're constantly trying to reevaluate the value proposition to our customer. Um, and that that focus on value has led us to be a high margin business, which has kind of obviously helped with uh, the growth trajectory, ability to reinvest and so on. And uh, so I'd say it was a mixture of the backdrop being negative, uh, but that definitely led us on a pursuit to focus on value. Uh, right. And the more you focus on value for your customer, I think the more you can lure them into significant deal size and commitments on a multi-year basis. Uh, I think every early phase company I see, they apply that lens to private equity and venture. So they're selling their equity with the same passion, mm. but they're applying it to funding as a pl- uh, with private equity or venture, not the ob- uh, obtaining revenue from the customer. And, and I'm just... Uh, Every minute of the day, thinking about the customer, how we can create more value for them. They have an extraordinarily tough job, and uh, it's a privilege to be even in a position to talk to them about it. And I, and I just think that that, as a pillar of focus, Paul maybe mentions about uh, certain entrepreneurs. I'm a technical background, but probably my pursuit for customer need is probably uh, my principal focus. Okay, okay. So so maybe you might just talk us through because you, you mentioned every single bit of the day, but. But I imagine you you put a little bit of a, a formal structure around this because I imagine like I just look at myself and, and my like day to day suddenly takes over and I actually have to carve out pieces of the day where I say, no, no, I need to think about what I want to be doing in three months from now, six months from now. Like, how do you go about your planning process? And maybe how did you go about it initially? And what have you done? Like, what have you learned? How has it evolved? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the great question. Like that plan behind me was uh, was my plan. What a mistake, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. uh, because I only really knew it uh, and the details within it. So that's kind of maybe where it was. Maybe it was a transaction between myself, uh, some ideas, and so on. Uh, really, where we're at now is that it it's a it's a fully operationalized rhythm within the year. So we have kind of a business unit every every uh, every month. We have a quarterly base camp that's focused on our growth plan, not the business process and the day-to-day numbers or whatever. It's purely focused on, right, where are we going? What's the challenge? What direction we need to take it? Sorry, what did you call that a base camp? Yeah, like our like our growth plan is called, uh, I don't know if people say, it's called the rise of the medicine accelerator. Uh, so there's a theme associated to it. Yeah. And there's our kind of 
picture of Everest there. So we have a kind of series of base camps that we conduct on a, on a quarterly basis. That's actually very, very smart. It's a good visual way to get people involved. Just brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and I think you have, as a leader, you have to distill down your message and gamify it somewhat, make it easy for people to digest. And, um, mm. you know, I didn't even have a title for this plan. It was just a, a bits of numbers or whatever, you know, whereas the, you have to, Paul mentioned the term, you have to have a very, very clear narrative yeah. to help, you know, lure in leaders to your business, uh, help manage your board, communicate to your customers. So, yeah, that's maybe an example of it. Uh, you have to have a very distilled message. And um, that's one big change. Mm. And it, the adjacent change, Tom, on top of that is uh, we, we would call it a, our leadership model, which is essentially the set of meeting dates, uh, who's in those meetings, what's the pre-read, what's the output, and how do we adjust the plan? So there's that leadership model is a big change. Carefully thinking who needs to be where and when, uh, be it your management team, your leadership team, your board, your advisory board, who's getting what and when. And uh, we spend a lot of time kind of trying to get that right so we have the right people on the pitch at the right time to make the right decisions, essentially. Um, so that's a big change. Um, but as I said, the, my priority is probably how to drive the narrative and um, the, the strategic plan, less so about the business. So how, how, I, how I chose that or delivered on that, I'm terrible at organization. And the COO dynamic. Yeah. I brought in uh, for APC. I brought in a COO uh, to run the basically to run the entire operation in 2016. Came from a large multinational pharma company, changed my life in terms of the value he brought. Then in 2021, we established VLE Therapeutics, and the best thing about that, when we established that manufacturing capability in VLE, it gave me the chance to bring in another COO. So maybe it's a reflection on how terribly disorganized I am. I need two COOs, but. Uh, <laughs> They are, they are the lifeblood in making something happen. Um, they have managed me out of the business as much as me. Like obviously, you have the desire to get out of the way, but they have been a game changer. Right. Okay. All right. You mentioned something there, just in in terms about trying to identify who to be involved in the planning process. Um, like I know myself that that. You know, some people get very offended if I leave them out. Some people like just want to be involved in the meeting, throw up their opinions then and there at the meeting and then walk away from it. So so is it a very structured? Uh, and then does that take away from all the thinking or or, or how does that work? So. Yeah, great question. And when we went, when I went on leadership for growth with EI in 2019, 1819. Yeah. The first delivery or beyond this kind of straw man here is a proper plan. Yeah. And the first time we did that um, was a realization that maybe I didn't have the right team, Tom, being very, very honest. Um, right. okay. And I think that that's okay. And that's very healthy because I think as the executive CEO or founder, you will start to see ownership or an accountability in those discussions, or perhaps you won't see it. So I think the first step as you emerge from this into this scaling agenda, it's maybe a chance just to reevaluate you know, do you have the right leadership group in place? Do you need to augment it? That's the first thing. As I went through that change, I went through a change then, 2019, 20, I changed uh, my, my leadership group, I brought in different kind of expertise um, and relationships uh, with people I had. And now we're at a stage where we're really carefully considered about who do we bring into those sessions? Uh, who's your succession plan for in certain areas? And we use the growth planning process to try drive people's development and maybe expose them to areas of the business that they're not uh, familiar with. So it's a great instrument to give people responsibility or give them a sense of what, what it's like to be a true leader in the business. It's fantastic. Now, uh, a final thought before I jump into the Q&A session and invite questions from the, the audience and invite fallback. But um, people often tell me, right, there's no need for a big business plan document. And obviously they, they, they jump on and they say, oh, VCs are only interested in, a, in, in our pitch deck. And then you have other people say, well, it's a very useful doorstep and all you need is a one pager. I mean, my personal view is um, in order to be able to write you a short letter, I need to have a long letter in the first instance, because that allows me to have a structured view and then I can summarize it down into a one or a two pager. Where are you on the whole uh, you mentioned a living document before. 
Yeah, it has to be. First thing I say, Thomas, it has to be living and breathing because, you know, each quarter as you iterate, your product changes, your customers, the market changes, like your plan has to kind of evolve with those conditions and opportunities. Mm. So it, it is a living thing, much like your execution focus is a living thing in the business, like trying to get revenue or trying to get customers. That's constant. So too, need your your strategic plan needs to, you need to be as passionate about that dynamic focus too. But I would say for me personally, if I did not have this plan, I would not have been able to lure in the leadership team. I would not have been able to lure in uh, the board, and I wouldn't have been able to strike strategic deals with our customers. I, I give our customers insights to this. Uh, I want them to feel our sense of the future so I can transact with them on 2025, not 2023. Uh, so to me, if we didn't have it, the business would be reliant on me uh, running around, jumping on airplanes, chatting to people to try articulate the our ambition and potential. This is a is an operational plan to bring that to life. And to be honest, without it, uh, the business will be less than half its size it is today. Okay. Okay. No, that's that's fantastic. Well, Paul, please come on to to, to camera. Um, just just actually, on it, like you know, having the plan is one thing, but execution, as they say, five percent idea, ninety five percent implementation. Um, and and I suppose maybe I'll ask I'll ask uh you, Paul, about that first, and and then maybe Mark, you might expand a little bit on that one as well. Yeah, so I think Mark has called it out really well. The, the the detail of the planning and the thinking going into the planning is obviously very important. But a plan is uh, at a state at a point in time, hmm. and but having clarity in the plan so that everyone can read the plan. Like you've seen Mark there, uh, be able to share the plan internally or externally or to advisors. That that helps make a much more productive narrative. It allows people input. So people are seeing in real paragraphs, real detail, and they're able to give their opinion in a much more valuable way than a you know, pitch deck, if, 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 if you like. Mm, yeah. It's the follow through though, that is where the, the, the real rubber hits the road and that there's a rhythm of review that everybody knows who's accountable for what and how are we doing? You know, it's not a, a device to beat people up with. It's, it's a device that accelerates learning because where the plan inevitably has a set of assumptions. For most plans, at least half the assumptions won't turn out to be correct. And that's fine because you're forecasting the future is a very difficult exercise as we all know. So it's having this dynamic rhythm of review, refresh and the right people in the room and not being afraid to be challenged. I think one of the things that, that Mark does very well in this is that he doesn't bring the ego into the room. So the fact that there's no ego in the room from the CEO must always be right. The humbleness that comes into the room creates the space for everyone else on the team to contribute, challenge, and keep the plan dynamic. Okay. Well, uh, and I suppose that dynamic piece, and, and maybe uh, I'll throw this at you, uh, you know, what is it, Shang Tzu said, uh, no, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. So, Mark, have you ever got it in that it's in your plan that all of a sudden you're going, "Oh, Jesus, everything has shifted, and we need to rethink about the way we're doing things." Yeah, oh, yeah, that's um, nothing like a bit of anxiety to bring the best out of the CEO or leader. And I think if you don't have it, and if you don't want it, uh, you're in the wrong game or whatever. So, kind of, I, I like. Um, I like when we get a bit of adversity externally or something happens that's a bit different to the plan and it creates opportunity. So like I can give an example, uh, we have all our financial numbers and targets here. We we delivered on the plan 2022. 2023, we're a bit shy, I'd say, in our first quarter. So what's really interesting, just, just to answer your question, Tom, what I love now within the strategic framework, the plan, in 2016, 17 and 18, everyone would come to me and go, Mark, what's the plan? Now, what are we doing? What's the plan? What's amazing now is I can go, I go into these meetings and I go to the team. What's the plan? What, yeah. a, what a beautiful way to get the best out of your leaders. It's not about me. It's actually about their insights, the things they're feeling in the business. And of course, I'll have a, a input and challenge like to what Paul mentioned. But I think, you know, just the fact that I like I can go around and ask that question. That's remarkable. Whereas I used to carry the weight of this idea 
not having a clue how to operationalize and everyone going, what, what's the plan? Where are we going? What are we doing? What's happened? You know, with this strategic plan, suddenly you can turn that narrative into your team, which is a great luxury and it gives you a great ability to scale because you're scaling with more people than just yourself. Well, okay, just I'm just on that theme, right? Because uh, this question has come in and it's basically asking us, you know, how how widely do you share that plan? I mean, do you share it with all your staff or uh, just the leadership level or do you maybe segment? Yeah. And you say, look, this is the plan for your area. Like, Yeah, absolutely. And one of the scaling challenges with it was in our plan, within the plan was exactly to address that. Who gets what content and when and, and in what form? So our board leadership team and our extended leadership team, which was a new group that we kind of put in place of high pro or high potential leaders within the business, mm -hmm. uh, they get this uh, plan. The broader organization gets a kind of distilled, more functional, uh, you know, department level one uh, that you know relates to this image, but they get kind of more objectives related to their area. Uh, but it, it is a constant communicated thing. We have a we have a monthly communication about our plan and then a quarterly base camp, as I mentioned, where the entire business comes together to kind of review progress versus plan. Uh, but that's, if you can crack that, that's a great win. Fantastic, yeah. Paul, uh, questions, actually, there's a couple of questions that come into you. Maybe I'll, I'll combine them a little bit. They're looking for, um, uh, to understand the difference between early growth and a scale up, and then uh, to comment on, you know, organic growth versus, external funding like VC growth? Yeah, so I'll take the, the early growth versus scale-up. To me, early growth is all about trying to figure out what the business model is. You know, who are the likely customers going to be or not be? What's the product? What's the value proposition? It's very uncertain and it's very exploratory. And in some senses, it has to be tactical because you're trying to keep the lights on. You're trying to figure out how to get the cash to... But that early growth is very, very high uncertainty. I see scale of when it's starting to look that you have something that's repeatable into a certain segment, that you have a product that now can be delivered in a relatively consistent time or service that can be delivered. So you're bringing more predictability into it. And then the next wave, if you like, we kind of think of these two waves of one being explore or one being exploit when you have a repeatable system and the next being explore. And it's mm -hmm. that repeat explore scalability. And the shift in scalability is often when the CEO starts getting time to actually delegate more and delegate more to the operational running of the predictable part of the business and scaling into the explore part. Okay. Yeah, the funding model, I'll pick up that very quickly because I know we're caught in time. I see a lot of uh, much more disciplined use of capital from investors now we've several very good examples looked at, i won't call them out who've been very diligent in that customer focus that mark referenced both tech companies and other companies because capital at the right time is an incredible catalyst for accelerating scale but capital too early can allow for with all due respect less diligent and disciplined thinking it can allow for sloppy thinking or sloppy hires whereas having to build a scalable model as much as possible before capital sometimes can be a very good discipline okay uh, that's excellent actually there's a question that's come in and it's it's one that's dear to my heart and and, and it feeds mark directly from the the you know that old adage uh culture eats strategy for for, for breakfast so how uh, how did you go about you know I suppose coming up with your 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 strategy for your organization and making sure that everyone was bought into it and that, that it wasn't going to be blocked within the by, by the culture? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, like so important. And I think you you know I think it's it's naive or foolish to think that you can kind of come out with kind of this you know new strategy and like that maybe if your culture is not ready for it that it's just going to fall apart because ultimately the culture wins. You know what I mean? So I think. Yeah. Uh, what I've been uh, very passionate about in our culture, it's, a, it's an extremely open uh, based culture. You can kind of see, even see at the labs, like the, the team are looking at me in, in my office constantly or whatever. Uh, so I think words to me in our culture that are very important are like open, we're porous, we're very, very curious. And I think if you start to consider the, 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 the cultural pillars you need, 
uh, to, to amplify your strategy, you'll be very successful. But if you don't coerce and plan and, and try to execute your culture in a particular way, ultimately your strategy is going to fall apart because you, the change management is required to scale. You're going to be asking your organization to be absolutely at the pin of their collar if you want to scale to 5, 10x, whatever. Sounds great, but really what you're asking them to do is to be whipped around a little bit for the next few years. And if you don't have the right culture, it's just not going to be, it's not going to be possible. So I think bringing people into it through your plan, through your cultural behaviors or leadership behaviors, organization behaviors is the only way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, Paul, any comment on that? Yeah, I think Mark used a very important term there, leadership behaviors. There's a lot of talk about culture in a sense, but the leadership behaviors are what are, is the catalyst, if you like, to the adoption of the plan. The CEO and the senior team, if they demonstrate the right leadership behaviors, then the chances of scale go up disproportionately. If they don't, the plan remains dead on the shelf. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's another question that's come in here. Uh, uh, well, first off, a comment. Uh, I, I love pursuit of cu customer needs, right? So, so it's great, Mark, so somebody's doing it. Uh, but, the, but they recognize that your target market, and they're probably guessing that, it, that it, it's extremely large co uh, customers that you have there. So how did you go about getting them to embrace your disruptive technology? Yeah, like a great, great question. And um, geez, I, I love talking to customers, just as the, just the first uh, thing. If, if I could just, if that's something I can get across to the, to the companies that are online here, they are the key to so much for your success in the future. So yeah, pursue the customers, I'm relentless. Um, but uh, yeah, there are, are early phase customers and even to this day, the biggest pharma companies in the world. And as I start to critically assess their needs, they absolutely have the big, biggest balance sheet in the world, some of the most incredible therapeutics or whatever, but the things they don't have as a result of that, uh, they don't have agility. Uh, they don't have autonomy quite often as well because they're so governed and structured as public PLCs. So in, in essence, their strengths are quite often are their weakness. And I, that's where I would really concentrate when I start to kind of categorize those customers. Uh, for the big guys, uh, agility and innovation is something that you can't undervalue. Uh, in fact, they really, really value access to it. And that's where we've 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 done some great deals. Okay. Um so so i i because i'm very conscious of the time and uh and i always like to do like a you know like Geraldo, uh you know a final thought of the day sort of thing but uh the, the, this question there's a couple of different questions that come in and uh, and i really like them um it's around they've got a couple of them that are in the process and they're going well three-year five-year plans how do you go about doing it you know what models should they look at whether it's a lean business canvas model um, and of course, then they're asking about whether Enterprise Ireland has any suggestions and stuff like that. But Paul, like I, I, as an expert who's seen a load of these things uh, and, um, you know, is there any one over the other that you would recommend? Is there any particular process? How, like what advice would you ultimately give? And by the way, Mark, I'm about to ask you the same question. What advice would you give uh, to, to to companies that are about to engage in this process? Yeah, so I think three uh, pieces of takeaway advice. Firstly, from a time horizon perspective, for most of the companies on this call, three years is the right time. Yeah. One year operational, two reaching out a little bit in three, but anything longer than three years is nonsense in, in, in my view. So three years is the first. I think the second is understanding, and it's obviously going to depend on the stage of the company, but understanding who are the key people in the room. But for the early planning, there is something that says if you've a group of five or seven involved, that's OK. Whereas if you've a cast of thousands, you're going to end up with nothing. Now, you may well end up with some iterations of it. And it takes time. Mm. Like you, you will not do the type of planning work that Mark is demonstrating there in a, a one and done. Let's go to a nice hotel and come out with a, a magic plan. This takes time and effort that's dependent on company stage and, and, uh, and ability. And I think that the third piece that I'd really encourage strongly is the follow through, making sure that there's actual detailed follow through. And sometimes that requires having some external input and sometimes that external input. I know we often find it ourselves. We say, well, gosh, you know, the team will say, well, because you guys are turning up at the end of the quarter, such and such happened or such and such happened. 
because sometimes that external dynamic is helpful just to keep the plan a little bit on track because most businesses are so consumed with the urgent of the day to day. So they'd be my three. Okay. And uh, if I could ask the same question to you, Mark, you know, you've lived it, you've breathed it. You, um, if you're to talk to a founder or, or, or to a management team now about, you know, what advice would you give them about going into a planning process? Yeah, like uh, first day of the gate, you need to work with the experts like Paul. Sorry, just to kind of say, this is not something that I have the competency doing. And I think no CEO should enter into a room as the lead in the planning of, uh, of such a document. I think it undermines the space you want your leadership team to take. I think that's a very, very delicate position to, uh, to take. The, the, I, I feel the CEO needs to go in with a degree of humility and vulnerability to get the best out of their team. So you need other experts, moderators, facilitators like Paul and others to kind of come in and drive that space and to drive the uh, the agenda. Obviously, <laughs> Like I'm like a bull with a rag. Like I want to go for it. I'll challenge. I'll input or whatever. But you can't dominate. I think that that's that's a that's a mechanical thing to be very considerate of. So don't don't call a meeting with your SLT or and say right we're going to start planning and here are the actions. I think that that's the wrong. Um, yeah. wrong okay. Uh, just, and then just the, the, the last thing is uh, yeah be considerate about who kind of comes in. Maybe your existing leadership team. Maybe you want to bring in one or two high, high potential, high performers outside of that. That you know might bring in the right little bit degree of tension into the room uh, and opportunity as well. And then lastly, it takes time. So this took uh, this iteration for me to bring start bringing in a few more people to the process to reorganize the business, which was a result of the growth plan. Probably took nine months to get off the ground, Paul. If I'm being honest, uh, yeah. you know. We started getting getting alignment after four or five months, and then it starts to have to become a plan. It takes time, takes a cycle. So don't underestimate the time it needs. It's not come in on a Monday, write stuff down, and that's your plan. You know. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, guys, what can I say? Just uh, really, really appreciate you spending the time. And I could actually sit here for another forty minutes to an hour uh, talking about that, but we are well and truly uh, out of time. So. Look, just a huge thank you to both of you for, for the time that you've given up today. I really appreciate it. Um, and of course, there'll be a recording of this as well for anybody who missed it. Um, so I'm going to conclude today, but just to tell you a little bit about um, uh, next month's session. Uh, so our next webinar will be on the 24th of May, um, the third webinar in our, in our Building for Scale series. And it's going to focus on the impact of the people strategy on the growth and the bottom line. So you've heard from, from both our speakers today about how important it is to have the right people at the table. Um, so this is very much going to be uh, encouraging companies who are looking at their scaling journey to understand how they need to look at their organizational culture, how they need to look at the structures, the HR processes, and the capabilities uh, of everyone that's involved to ensure that there's overall alignment with the, with the business goals. So I'm going to be joined by Karen Hernandez, who's a senior executive in EI. And I know a lot of our client companies are very familiar with Karen. She does a lot of one-to-one -one engagements to support them, uh, to put in place appropriate management structures and capabilities uh, to help drive business growth. And then uh, Owen Leonard, uh, who is the CEO and founder of I3PT and OBI. Um, again, another one of Enterprise Ireland's rapidly scaling businesses. Uh, and another one of our L4G participants, um, he's going to be joining us and talk to them about their, their rapidly scaling journey. So once again, thanks to everybody who uh, has been part of this and, and helped us get it up off the ground. There's a whole team of people behind me here, uh, Owen, Roisin, Jane, and everyone to get it up and running. Uh, and thanks to everybody for listening. If you want to sign up to future ones, please, I encourage you to go on to our Global Ambition uh, website and look at our, our events that are coming up. All right. Thank you, everybody.